Newcastle United have qualified for the UEFA Champions League for the first time in 20 years and that's it. That's the intro. Hello there everybody, Adam Cleary and his thoroughly justifiable weekday hangover for 442 here and if I may just be permitted this one thing... <laughs> Thank you. So what are we here to talk about? Well, first of all, how Newcastle United's qualification for the Champions League, and I ain't getting bored of saying that anytime soon, owes everything to Eddie Howe very smartly identifying a problem with this starting eleven and how and why he then changed it to this starting eleven. But also, and this is more just a through line rather than anything I'm going to address directly, how with just one season of reasonable investment and a little bit of ambition, Newcastle United went from circling the drain of the Premier League to the top table of European football and how thus, Mike Ashley, you can go in, in a hole. Okay, so I'm just going to set my stall out here with one sort of statement, and if your reaction to that is, eh, what's he on about, then just sort of go with it for a second. That Newcastle United have finished the season in the top four, still incredible, by the way, is a remarkable achievement, but that they were in the top four at the start of the year was not a remarkable achievement. In fact, there was nothing special about that. You see, pretty much every single season, some teams that nobody expects emerge from the pack and have a really good crack at breaking that top four. Christmas Eve 2020, Leicester was second in the league, only four points behind Liverpool, and Everton were ahead of Chelsea, Tottenham, and Manchester City in fourth. The year before that, Leicester were once again in second place, and Wolves were just two points behind Chelsea in fifth. A few years before that, West Ham United and Southampton looked like they were going to contest the fourth spot, with Arsenal, Tottenham, and Liverpool all miles off the pace. And I mean, I could go on. I can remember Hull City doing it when they came up from the championship. I can remember Newcastle doing it under Apology and what feels like an entire other life ago. There's always teams that do what Newcastle did in the first half of the season. But what inevitably seems to happen is they just can't make that last over an entire season. Like maybe they've got some incredibly clever system that other teams just start figuring out and the results start to drop away. Maybe they just get a couple of injuries and they don't have the same squad depth as the bigger clubs that are chasing them and eventually they get overtaken. Whatever the reason is, the result is always the same. This or some equally boring variation of it. The big six filling the top four. And to be completely blunt, this was going to happen to Newcastle United. It even started to happen to Newcastle United. They had a major wobble around the same time as the League Cup final. The results fell away. They stopped scoring goals. They stopped getting their clean sheets and they dropped out of the top four for the first time since they went into it. And this, my friends, is why I want to make this video because I don't think anybody's really picked up on the change Eddie Howe made. And I just think it deserves a little bit of appreciation. So this is the Newcastle team from the first half of the season. In fact, this is the team that lined up in their last game before the World Cup against Chelsea, except I've cheated slightly because that was Chris Wood, but it was only because Wilson wasn't fully fit. He would have started. And what this team would always go out to do was to play as much of the game as possible in this area of the pitch here, the opponent's defensive third. They would hound defenders, hound goalkeepers, hound midfielders. They would put as much pressure on in this area as they could, and they were known as a high-pressing counter-attacking side. Now, this style of play undoubtedly caught a lot of teams out in the first part of the season, but they continued with it after the World Cup and the results started to drop off as teams began to expect it. Following the Leicester City game at the resumption of the season, Newcastle United had a Premier League run-in of Leeds United, Arsenal, Fulham, Crystal Palace, West Ham and Bournemouth. Now with the exception of Arsenal, those are probably all games that any side with top four aspirations should be targeting three points from, but Newcastle only managed one win in that entire run. A last minute goal from Alexander Isak taking what was certainly going to look like a nil-nil draw into a scraped through 1-0 win. Now their defending, which had been the bedrock of this success, was absolutely still there. They only conceded two goals in this entire run, but at the same time, they only scored three. Leeds, Fulham, Palace, West Ham, Bournemouth, these were all teams that now knew what to expect from Newcastle, were defending really deep were basically treating it like they were going to the Eddie Hard or Anfield and grinding out or getting very close to grinding out little results. They went away to the Etihad in March, got beat, dropped out with the top five, and this is where it reasonably looked like it was all going to start to unravel and they were going to filter back down sort of in that sort of 10th to 6th area 
of the table. But Eddie Howe took a look at his team and took a look at his system and he thought, you know what? If they're starting to get the answers, I'm going to change the questions. All right, so I actually only discovered this the other day and this absolutely blew my mind. This is Newcastle United, the high-pressing counter-attacking side who want to win the ball back in this area of the pitch, right? Well, if we look here, this is every single high turnover they had made this season right up to them dropping out of the top four against Man City. Now, that's a lot of high turnovers. They were really, really good at winning the ball back. In fact, if we look here, they rank as one of the best teams in the league for winning the ball in the defensive third. But now, and gird your loins for this, this is every single one of those turnovers that led to a shot, and this is every single one of those shots that led to a goal. And that is not good. In fact, they go from being one of the best teams in the league at winning the ball back in the defensive third to being one of the worst teams in the league for converting high turnovers into shots and goals. And the reason for that is simple. Teams were defending incredibly deep, knowing they were going to get pressed high by Newcastle. So if they did lose the ball, they still had lots of players in that area. So Newcastle didn't get an open chance. And this might sound slightly harsh, but teams knew this might work because Newcastle didn't have the individual quality on the pitch to play through it. As a team, they are brilliant at the high press, but at individuals, they can't then make things happen out of nothing. Like if you think back to when Liverpool were the undeniable masters of this, you could very well put 10 players behind the ball so you can crowd around it if you lose it. But players like Mo Salah can weave through three or four players and score improbable goals with amazing finishes. Newcastle have the players to enact the system, but not the individuals to do that. So let's say you're Eddie Howe. What do you do in this situation? You've got a team that you know are really good at pressing the ball high, stopping teams playing out from the back, but said teams are now defending so deep that you're no longer able to convert any of that into goal scoring opportunities. What do you do? How do you somehow fix what is going wrong without ruining what is going right? That is the challenge he faced in March. And what he decided to do was not change the fact that the Castle United were a pressing team, but to change the reason why they were a pressing team. Instead of Newcastle pressing teams in their own defensive third to try and win the ball back and create chances, because they weren't scoring from those chances, he wanted to press them in this area to stop them building up from the back and to force them to go long. And the reason you do that is because if teams can't get their build-up going and can't play through you, and they go more direct into the middle area of the pitch, that then forces them to push up as a unit and congests the whole game in this area. And if the whole game is being congested in this area, then that means what Newcastle can do instead of counter-attacking and high-pressing is they can have what's known as direct attacks. Oh, there's the jargon terminology alarm. A direct attack is basically anything that starts in your half of the pitch and within 15 seconds allows you to get a chance on. Now, the best example of this is Fabian Scher and Joe Linton against West Ham. You remember that goal. Everything was compressed into the middle area of the pitch. Newcastle weren't trying to press high or play through. They just got the ball to Scher in this area. He played one direct ball into Joe Linton and because there was space in behind against a team, West Ham, remember, who probably would have sat off Newcastle and defended otherwise, he got through and he scored. But the other best way to illustrate this is the changes in personnel. Miggy Almiron was absolutely invaluable to Newcastle in the first half of the season. He got injured, Jacob Murphy came in, and when Almiron came back, couldn't get Murphy out of the team. And the reason for that is because Miggy Almiron has the numbers and the statistics to be the absolute perfect right-sided attacker for a team that are trying to press and win the ball back and create chances in the opposition third. He's just a live wire of energy. But the one thing, the one thing that Jacob Murphy does that Miguel Almiron doesn't is he carries the ball from your half into the opposition's half and tries to make chances as a result. Like generally progressive carries, they're known at. Murphy nearly makes five every single game. He is almost in the top 10% of midfielders in Europe for that stat. Whereas Miggy Almiron is just not his game. He makes just over two of them per game. He's in the bottom half of all players in Europe for that. It's why from March until he got injured, Alan St. Maximum was starting pretty much every single game. Yes, he's not going to give you the defensive solidity that Joe Linton was providing in that area of the pitch, but what he is going to do is he's going to get the ball and he's going to run with it. And just purely from a numbers perspective, Alan St. Maximum's had an absolutely rotten season for Newcastle compared to the standards he set, but the two things he is still doing really well on are, you're not going to believe this, carry and take-ons he is still despite how bad the air he's had in the top one percent in european leagues for doing that and yeah i mean they conceded a lot more goals but that's just the price you pay like you're playing the game in this area of the pitch more than you're playing it in this area of the pitch which is a lot closer 
to your own goal and you're sacrificing players who do a great job and never let you down and are defensively switched on for those who are just great with the ball at their feet, who can run, who can make things happen, who can take those opportunities when they present themselves. That's the job of a manager. That's the risks you have to take. And again, for all Eddie Howe was like, oh, I don't think Wilson and Isak should really be playing together. We see Isak is more playing through the middle. When he saw how good at dribbling and how good on the ball and how good at taking people on Isak was, he got into that left side of the pitch and he made the position his own because that's what he wanted those wide players to do. So there you go. That's how Eddie Howe took the unremarkable achievement of getting into the top four in one half of the season and turned it into the absolutely unbelievable, has this actually happened? Am I going to Italy achievement of finishing in the top four by the end of the Premier League season? But I desperately need to take two paracetamol now. So everybody, please let me know what you make of all of this in the comments below. And if you haven't got any insightful opinions, just say the name of a city in Europe you'd like to go to this season because that'll put a massive big grin on my massive big face but in the meantime though thank you very much for watching if you did enjoy this video please do share it around to all your friends that helps us more than you could possibly imagine and if you're having a nice time here please do subscribe to the channel because we're going to be doing all this stuff over the summer and i can't wait if you'd like to catch me on twitter you can at adam cleary c-l-e-r-y i do dearly love to hear it from you all and ooh, what's that new 442 world's greatest football magazine about to drop in shops probably by the time this video goes out so be on the lookout for that but until next time, this has been 442. I'll see you soon.